I just received the alumni and doctoral faculty uh, prize for the most distinguished dissertation at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, I believe these awards are, are, are handed out to, to students in different departments, so um, the, I, I must have peers in other departments, but I won the sole award for the English department this year. The, the concept of the dissertation was this. Basically, I wanted to chart the intersection of nationalism uh, as it relates to the period in Great Britain um, from the first act of union through the second act of union, 1707 to 1801, and how cultural forms, specifically um, British Romanticism, uh, aided and abetted the uh, dissemination, the construction, the production of British nationalism. So I came at the dissertation from, from a kind of uh, constructivist point of view that looked at nationalism not as something that is um, ethnic, that is, uh, that goes back thousands of years, that is, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, either cultural or blood or linguistic or so on, which is sort of the way that nationalists talk about themselves, but instead as something that is um, what uh, some critics have called an invented tradition, an imagined community. And so how did the, the, the poets, and poetry in particular in this period, help to imagine that community? That was my question. I'll start by saying that the constraints of my, my study were, were limited to just romantics and just the poets. So I was looking primarily at uh, William Wordsworth, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, I looked at uh, William Blake. Um, I looked at, um, I, I wanted to particularly uh, examine the way that femininity was uh, kind of combined uh, or allowed to operate within patriotic discourse. So I looked at uh, Felicia Hemmings and Anna Letitia Barbald, um, who are lesser known now in terms of being studied, but actually were very well known in their period, uh, particularly Felicia Hemmings, who, who, who probably outpublished Wordsworth. Um, so those are the poets I worked with. I also had ambitions to, uh, to write about and examine um, Percy Shelley and, um, and, and Lord Byron. Of course, they are you know, well known for their uh, support of different nationalist causes on the continent, um, and, but that never came to fruition as of yet. I do have plans to, uh, to add another chapter um, as I take this dissertation and turn it into a, a, a book. And uh, that's my next step. Uh, well, first of all, I was looking for popularity. Uh, how popular were these poets? Um, did, their, um, did their work have longevity? Did it have um, a kind of staying power? Um, so that's why I spend the first chapter examining uh, their the degree, their degree of representation in the various forms of canonization, the actual material forms of it, the anthologies and uh, the, the collected works and so on. And I looked at their reception um, by uh, both in their day and later on, looking at you know, people like Arnold um, talking about these poets and ranking them and so on. So if they left a big footprint, so to speak, then I thought that these poets were probably poets who were important for that era. And the other thing was just examining aspects, what I call ideologemes, of British nationalism, um, coming out of some of the, you know, the, the research that's been done on that period to examine what exactly constituted British nationalism. I took those things, I divided it up into you know, sort of its essential forms, and I looked for it, I searched for it in the poetry to see if there indeed was some expression of this stuff. Um, so one of the things is, um, in the period, um, Britain was defined by, um, often by its um, its alterity to or difference from other things, perceived aliens, like the French, Catholics, uh, the colonial natives, and so on. So I looked at how uh, the, the poetry grappled with those issues. And indeed, um, I found a lot of evidence for, uh, for instance, in Coleridge, I have a chapter or at Coleridge talking about um, the whole British idea of them being the, the new chosen people. The decision to use the name Britain to define the, this new nation state is in itself fascinating and has historical precedent. Um, and it's one of the questions that I had to wrestle with at the beginning of the dissertation because you know, you have people referring to these poets as English and then others as British and so on. And so I had to sort through what is British, what is English, and of course uh, that begged the question, what is Scottish, what is Welsh, and what are the other uh, constituencies here? I was, um, what is Irish? Of course the Irish never get fully assimilated and so on, but we could talk about the Northern Irish. Um, and so that took me on this quest, this investigation, going back to the, the pre-Roman era you know, um, of uh, the island. And uh, I discovered that the term Britain was actually, uh, the, the, um, 
the Britanni was a Greek word that described, and the Greeks had actually so, sort of circumnavigated that area and had um, some limited interaction with the Celts who resided on what is now the island of Great Britain. And they called them the Britanni because that meant those people who paint themselves blue. You know, if you've seen like uh, Braveheart with William Wallace, you know, the woad warriors, um, that's what it referred to. So it actually comes from Greek derivation, and the Romans picked it up when they colonized England around, uh, or, or, or the island around, I think it was 100 AD, somewhere around there. So I discovered that um, there's actually a kind of cultural and genetic and linguistic link um, between the Welsh and, and, and the Bretons in northern France. Um, so so the, the Bretons are really, uh, I would say that the, the whole, con the, the name Breton is an invention by the West, loosely, the, the Greco-Roman antiquity, um, used to describe the Celts, who are then colonized over and over again, and then again in 1066 by the Normans and so on. Um, although there are pockets of these Celts, who are called Britons, who kind of retain some of their culture. So the only people who have a claim to call themselves Britons are these Celts, who are either in Brittany in France or in uh, you know, these, these little isolated pockets in Wales. The name Briton gets used several times thereafter during the Renaissance um, by King James I as a kind of conciliatory term to try to kind of reunite the island through this mythic kind of genealogy that goes back to the pre-Roman colonization of the island. So now, because no one is a Briton anymore, Britain becomes this kind of free-floating identity that can be used to encase or encompass all of the various um, ethnicities that live on the island. And there's, there's you know, I find, I find, when I looked it up in the OED, I found quotes um, uh, from the Renaissance, where the, the word was used in the context of, there was a, a quote, something like, um, and we, we look forward to when the hateful terms of English and Scottish shall be no more, and we will all be Britons, right? And then again, King James, who is a Scottish king who ascends to the English throne, so he combines the thrones in 1603, he declares himself the king of Great Britain. You know, so more and more, this idea that there is a greater Britain that encompasses and contains all of these, 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 these warring factions um, becomes um, more powerful, more sustainable. Um, and in 1707, they decide uh, that, um, you know, politically they were going to transform this place into Great Britain.